You're listening to the REI Clarity Podcast, the show that guides you from confusion to clarity and sets you on the path to financial freedom faster. Learn how to grow your portfolio the right way with your host, REI advisor and co-founder of Shine Insurance, Jeremy Goodrich. Hey there, Jeremy Goodrich, your host for the REI Clarity Podcast. Our guest today's name is Rachel Richards, and she is a real estate investor. She has about 40 different units. She is an author. She's written two best-selling books called Money Honey and Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement. And in our conversation, she takes us to a place that I'm not sure we've exactly gone in past episodes. I knew that she understood financial literacy. I knew that she had multiple streams of income and she has aggressively retired at the age of 27. And she'll talk in our interview about what that means, but she has a real handle on how finances work and how passive income works for her. In fact, I start the conversation off really asking a question about her definition of passive income. And the reason I did that is I feel like a lot of people use that term in a lot of different ways. And I wanted her to define where she was coming from right from the start. And she does an amazing job of doing that. Rachel is focused. Rachel is determined. Rachel makes clear goals for herself and her family and really, really works hard to attain them. So if you're someone who is looking for financial structure, if as you're building your real estate investing journey, you say to yourself, oh, I really need help with that financial side, need help with my mentality around that financial side. I think this episode is really for you. We get into the nuts and bolts of money and how to navigate money in an intelligent, thoughtful way and use it to better your family and your life and your real estate investing journey. So without further ado, my interview with Rachel Richards. So I want to start with the concept of passive income. I think that it can be a catchphrase sometimes. It can get used by people in a lot of ways to even manipulate other people in the worst spaces. So I guess my question for you is, how do you define passive income and how do you apply that to your theory? Yes, I'm glad you asked because I agree. It can definitely be misused, misunderstood. The way I define passive income is that it's money that's earned with little to no, to no ongoing effort. So it's no get rich quick scheme. It does mm-hmm, take time right. or money to create. And I think that's where a lot of people get it wrong. The way I see it is that it's in two stages. Stage one, you're investing the time or you're investing the money to get that passive income stream created. Then once you have it going or you have launched it, then you're in stage two and that's when it becomes a lot more hands off. And I haven't had an epiphany a few years ago that once your passive income exceeds your living expenses, you're retired, you're financially independent. So that's what my husband and I started working towards. So great. So when you understand this concept of passive income, it's not that it just magically somehow makes you money. It's that you decide what you want to do on your path towards something that ultimately will be fairly passive. But even when you get there, are you just doing nothing? No. And some people could, but, you know, some people retire and they want to do the beach thing or golf and that stuff is great. I mean, to each their own for sure. I just get bored easily. So I, I always want to be creating something or building something. So the way I see it is that passive income has enabled me to work when, where, or if I want. And now that I'm financially dependent, I can choose whether I I want to keep working or not. I can basically do whatever I want with my time and I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to be making money or not. That's so great. So the first phase is, is stage one, which is creating the infrastructure underneath the thing that you hope ultimately will become passive. Mm-hmm. And then the second stage is that it's fairly passive. That could be different for different kinds of revenue streams, um, but it has uh, essentially little to no work in that stage too. Is that right? Right. And is anything truly passive? 
I don't know if it, maybe portfolio income because you're investing your money and you're just earning dividends. Yeah. The rest of the types of passive income, though, they are going to require a little bit of effort just to maintain the income stream, whether it's a few hours a month or a couple hours a week. Some people would say, well, that's not passive. But in my opinion, when you compare it to an active full time 40 hour a week job, it's very passive. Yeah, and I think that you're controlling how much energy you put into it. You could put almost no ener- energy into it, and it may still trickle money in. And then if you want to really boost it up and try and bring more money in, then you could push into it harder, more hours a week, and make it work. I think that any idea of not doing anything just brings it down to a trickle. But you kind of have control over how much money comes in from that stream. Is that fair to say? Yep. Yeah, I agree with that. So you have multiple income streams. Can you describe for us what those are? Yes. So I currently have four. I have, mm-hmm. and I'll, I'll kind of get into the income details too. My rental income gener- in a normal month makes anywhere from seven to $12,000 per month in profit. My husband and I own almost 40 rental units. Then I have my book royalty income. I have two best-selling books and February was my first $7,000 month in book profits. Love it. So th- yeah, thanks. That's where I am on that. Then I have my online course that I just launched. It's called Get Your Financial Bleep Together. And it goes <laughs> along with my first book, Money, Honey. Um, yep. And that it's hard to say how much that's going to bring in because it's so new, yeah. but probably, you know, one or $2,000 a month. And then I have a print on demand business. And this is very passive. I don't do any work for this at all. But this is basically where you have you sell products, but you don't have a physical inventory. So there are all these platforms out there that have tote bags and phone cases and t-shirts and you create designs to go on them. And when that product sells, you're paid a royalty. So it eliminates the financial risk, the inventory risk. So it's really, really brilliant. Great way for anyone to start creating passive income. Um, And that one's probably just bringing in two or 300 bucks a month, but it really is 100% passive right now. So did you like, so what that created in my mind on that particular one, then we'll go to the ones that are maybe more what you're doing. But when I was growing up, I was 18, 19, whatever, I would always come up with bumper sticker slogans. And I'd always be like, man, that would be a great slogan. Like, are you coming up with slogans and then putting them out there and basically people buy and sell and you get a little royalty from it? Yeah, exactly. It could be an image, like a graphic design, or it could be a text-based design, a slogan, like you said. Just anything that comes into our minds, we'll write it down, have the design created, and then just see if it sells. And it's it's really easy. And that sounds really fun, too, actually. It is fun. You get to like <laughs> these cool things coming out of your mind. Wow, so I didn't realize that all these great bumper sticker slogans that I think are great, but there's one <laughs> good way to find out is to put it out there, or a graphic design, or whatever. That's really cool. So the print-on-demand is, is, is one piece of it. Let's talk about the rental income from your properties. This show is about folks who want to jump from side hustle investing to full-time investing. And what I like about this conversation is maybe this pushes back on that a little bit because you're not full-time investing. You've got these multiple streams, right? Yeah. And and that's the great thing about it is you can run it however way you want. You have the option. So as you grew your portfolio, what were, what was your strategy on that side? Initially, I only really knew about real estate investing, and I decided real estate investing was going to be my path to early retirement. So we started looking for properties in 2016. My husband and I bought our first duplex in 2017. We had a couple things going for us. First, we were investing in Louisville, Kentucky. So it's a great market to invest in anywhere in the Midwest. You know, prices are reasonable, great rental Mm -hmm. market. So our duplex cost $100,000, which even for Louisville is a great price. And we had to come up with the $20,000 down payment. The second thing we had going for us is that we both graduated from college without Mm. debt. Um, I sold, have you heard of Cutco Cutlery? Yeah, absolutely. I have a Cutco (laughs) knife that my my mom got me. I don't even know the story behind it, but yes, totally know what you're talking about. (laughs) Best knives in the world. Um, I'm a knife snob, but yeah, I sold Cutco throughout college and I paid my way through school. And then my husband is a Navy veteran, so he, he used his military benefits to pay for his college. So we graduated without debt, which obviously was really helpful in terms of us saving money early Mm -hmm. on. Um, But I also will say I've never made six figures in my life. I've been able to achieve financial independence even on a low to medium income. And my first job out of college 
I was making $32,000, but I was still finding a way to save 50% of my income even then. So it didn't take us very long, just a few years for us to get that $20,000 down payment by the duplex. And that's where our real estate journey began. Yeah. So you started with the duplex and how did that first buy go? I mean, I know that it's always like your first buy oftentimes works out great. Your first buy oftentimes works out terribly. How did it go for you? Our first buy, I think, is the best investment we've ever made. <laughs> so we got really lucky, but it took months. I mean, I think it took us nine months mm -hmm. to find the property. And so for a lot of new investors out there, that initial search can be really tough. We had offers on houses that didn't work out. We had accepted contracts on other properties that fell through because of the inspection. So it can definitely be very discouraging. And the one thing I think I did right in the beginning was I was just patient and I trusted the process and I waited and I knew that something would come up eventually and I didn't settle for anything less. And that's why I think the first deal worked out so well. So you made that first deal and that's where a lot of listeners are, right? After their first deal, not probably not covering your life expenses, even though you've found a way to keep your life expenses very limited, um, but not covering your life expenses. You were still in a full-time job. Is there a time that you really took that leap from the you know side hustle real estate investing in particular to full-time real estate investing? When did the leap come that you left your day job? Yeah. And, you know, I think a lot of times people say, take the leap of faith and the net will appear. And I'm conservative. So I tend to disagree with that advice. You know, I tend to say, make sure you're monetizing your side hustle. Make sure you have other income coming in before you quit your job. And in my case, I my first goal was to fully replace my full-time income before I quit. So that was a lofty goal. And it's funny because I did that in 2018 and I knew it was going to be hard to quit my job. I was going to be walking away from a lucrative finance career. So it actually took me an entire year to quit. And by then we got to the $10,000 a month mark in passive income. And I was like, okay, it's time time to quit. You it's time to it go now. full time. Yeah, exactly. So you did it. Yeah. I mean, it took two years of us just completely sacrificing. It was so much work. It, I mean, it just went by. I can't even remember those two years. I feel like it, we were working 80 hours a week, both of us working our full-time jobs, looking for properties and managing our properties on the weekends. And I was writing my books in the evenings. Wow. So it was tough. And I know, I don't know if I would have done it any differently because in the middle of it, it's extremely difficult. But now, of course, looking back, I'm like, yes, it was worth it. It takes a, a level of commitment. Like I just imagine my daily routine and the work that I do. I'm, I own an insurance agency. I do a lot of podcasting, things like that. And so like, how did you, maybe as an off topic question, but like, how did you frame your, in your mind, the ability to switch from one thing to the other and not be like, forget it, I'm just going to watch TV tonight. Or forget it, I'm just going to, you know, go do something else tonight. Like, how did you keep that stamina through that process? Yeah, and there were definitely times that I quit in one way or another. I quit writing my book, my first book early on, because I was convinced it was complete crap. And I wasn't going to go through with it. Um, so there were, it wasn't just, it comes off as if it's this easy thing. I achieved all this in two or three years, but it was just a lot of struggle, a lot of ups and downs. The thing for me is they say fear is, is a big motivator. And I had always had this fear of not having enough money. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a really wealthy county. Everyone else I went to high school with, like there were, there were people that turned 16 that were getting BMWs for their birthday. And I was not getting a new car. You know, my family wasn't going on vacations. We weren't even going out to eat at restaurants. So at a young age, I didn't feel like I fit in. And that's not the way you want to feel when you're in middle school and in high school. And I just remember thinking at some point, I don't want to end up like everyone else struggling with money. I don't want to have to operate on a strict budget my whole life. I don't want to have to borrow money from family and friends to make it to my next paycheck. I wanted to be different. And I knew that what I did then would either set me up for wealth or for poverty. So that fear, it just, it was a huge motivator of not having enough money, of being dependent on somebody, of not being able to take care of myself and my loved ones if I needed to. And I think that's really, when it comes down to it, what made me go so hard for so long. 
I think that's awesome. And so many people use, maybe it's a feeling of fear or maybe it's a feeling of stuck or maybe it's a feeling of, you know, not being able to provide as the motivation under which they, they make these moves. I mean, sometimes the fear is you lost your job. You didn't have a, you know, you didn't have a choice at that point. And I think oftentimes when you see people most motivated is when they don't have that safety net of their job, which is the argument sometimes for jump. It's like, well, if you don't have the safety net for your job, you really are going to be focused on, you know, making this other thing work. But you were capable of kind of making all those things work at the same time or fear of having a terrible boss. You know, there's a lot of those stories. Oh, yeah, I've had that, too. I mean, bosses that made me cry, bosses that were bullied. But you're right, you bring up a good point because the other side of the argument is that just quitting your job without having the backup plan, I mean, that's going to force your own hand and that's going to make you really start to hustle. So there is something to be said for that as well. This episode of REI Clarity is brought to you by Shine Insurance. Shine Insurance is the number one real estate specialist for investors in the Midwest. We work with real estate investors who have more than 10 units of single family, multifamily, and commercial real estate. At Shine, our process is simple, our policies are smart, and when you need us, we shine. Let me tell you another quick insurance story. So I had kind of the perfect scenario. The scenario I see all the time happen the other day. Someone called me. She was on vacation, actually. She was sitting in her vacation house and all of her family and kids and grandkids and things like that were out running around doing whatever. And she was just noodling about her insurance, thinking about her insurance and the fact that she had, I think she had 15 units and she had 10 different insurance policies with four different insurance companies. Bills were coming all the time from different places. She really had to make sure she was in on top of it. She was organizing it. She knew what was going on and let alone the coverage on the policies, whether that was any good or not. She had zero advice, no advisor. And so I said to her, look, I would love to organize what you have. I'd love to put together a proposal. I'd love to make that with one company. I'd love to make it streamlined so it's really, really clear. And I would love to be your insurance advisor over time and prove to you over and over again the value of working with us. She ultimately decided to work with us. We were able to save her some money, streamline her policy, make everything a lot easier, and she feels like she has an advisor right now. So if you're an investor in the Midwest, and by that I mean from North Carolina all the way up to Wisconsin, and you have a portfolio larger than 10 units, and you believe your insurance advisor is an important part of your team, or should be an important part of your team if they are not right now, then Shine is totally right for you. Please take 10 minutes to reach out right now at shineinsurance.com and change the way you feel about insurance. So as someone who's aggressively retired at 27, I mean, essentially, it seems like you have to have a really clear idea of your future. And like one of the parts of the REI Clarity Framework is forecast your future. I wonder as you were getting into any of these processes, whether it was the writing of the books or the investing in real estate, um, how did you set up your plan and how did you forecast your future? With the real estate, everything was more clear. And that's why I started out thinking I was going to achieve all this just with real estate. My initial plan, and I think I had read this in a book somewhere, maybe Hold by Steve Chater and the McKissicks. That's one of my favorite rental books. I was going to buy a single family house, one per year for 15 years, all on 15 year mortgages. And that way, after 15 years, I was going to retire once those mortgages started getting paid off. So I was planning on retiring in my mid thirties if I was gonna start in my twenties. And that was my initial plan. Everything just felt very clear cut to me. I had mapped it all out. And I even remember I would do a spreadsheet with my husband, maybe, I don't know, once a quarter, something Mm -hmm. like that. We would look at all of our expenses and make sure they hadn't like crept up on us or kept growing over the past few months. We would always be keeping our expenses in line. And we would think, well, how much passive income do we need to retire and quit our jobs? 
And at first we were like, well, if our expenses are 6,000 a month, we need 6,000 a month. And then I was like, well, wait a second. We want some buffer room. <laughs> yeah, right. We want some wiggle room for, cause things will go wrong. And we also still want to p- continue to save even in retirement. So and again, I'm conservative. I just like to have that extra money set aside. So that's why we ended up making our goal $10,000 a month. And that's what I would cur- encourage anyone to do is start with your expenses and then say, how much more above that do you want to have an income? How much do you still want to be saving for a month? And that's where you get your goal. Do you have a suggestion for like how much above your expenses uh, is a rule of thumb? I would say at least 20%, but I wanted a really, really big buffer. So ours is much bigger than that. I mean, we're still saving several thousand dollars a month. So I, I think it's mostly personal preference on that, but I would say at least 20% more. Okay. So I interrupted your flow there. You were saying you figure out how much you want to make, uh, base it on your expenses and then increase by some and take it from there. Yeah. And then I think you can work backwards um, with with something like portfolio income or rental income. To me, it's more black and white because you can somewhat project the cash flow that you might get from that. You can do the math. Something like royalty income, on the other hand, writing a book, launching a course, that is very, very hard to predict. And I remember when I first launched Money Honey, I had invested under $600 to write the book, get the cover created, hire the editor, everything. So it, it cost me a little over 500 to launch it. And I was so frugal because I just wanted to make that money back. My initial goal was, I just want to break even. I don't want to lose money on this. <laughs> and then it turned into a legitimate income stream. And I don't think it was until a year later after I launched Money Honey that I realized, okay, this is a legitimate income stream. I really feel I can count on this and include this in our passive income. So this is gonna help us reach our goals. And I think that might be the way you have to approach it with royalty income. It makes total sense. So you don't count on anything until you see that there is a consistent stream, until you see that there is some success in what you're doing, until you have some history of what numbers are going to come in. And then even then you probably wanna be careful with something like royalty income. Although a book like yours, I think will be consistent because of what it's about financial literacy and things of that nature is consistent through time, Mm -hmm. but don't count on it until it's there. Yeah. And and with books particularly too, you tend to have this peak of activity after you launch, first few months after you launch, and then it maybe stays steady for a while, but most books tend to start trickling down. And that's why, you know, I always say with passive income, you do have to put work in to maintain the income. So to, to maintain my book royalties, I'm just doing a little bit of marketing each week, essentially. Yeah. Coming on podcasts, talking about things. That's That's time. You're taking time right now to come on our show, which is not 100% passive. But if you have to do three podcast interviews a couple of days a week and that increases your revenue exponentially, it's absolutely a lot more fun than going to a day job from nine to five. Yeah. And for me, it just doesn't even feel like work anymore because this is so fun to me. Like this is what fulfills me. This is my passion. So I could work all day and be like, that was so fun. I had the best day ever. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Let's go back into the rentals a little bit. And as you grew your portfolio, you have what, about 40 uh, doors right now? Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Something 38, something like that. Yeah. So did you have buys like as far as things that didn't work? Tell me a, a story of uh, something that didn't work perfectly well. Well, I've made many mistakes and I still do. I think it's always a learning process with real estate investing. There is definitely an important story that I'll share. And it's about property management. And this is the biggest and most expensive mistake that I made in my journey as a real estate investor. But we got to the point, my husband and I, when we were still working full time, we had acquired all these units and we just could not manage them on our own anymore. And it was time to hire a property manager. We always knew we wanted to because we didn't want to quit our jobs to become full time landlords. So we always knew it was we were eventually going to hire a property manager. So about, about what point did you do that? How many units did you how many units were you at when you made that turn? I think we were at 20 Six. That's a lot. Because it was right before we bought our final acquisition, which was another 12 units or something like that. So you decided in the 20s that you needed a property manager. Yeah, because we were working full time still too. And I was writing books. So we needed help. (laughs) We were, (laughs) yeah, it was pretty hard. And then me being, you know, so frugally minded, I was like, well, man, it's going to be really expensive to hire a property management company. Maybe we can hire an individual or an employee instead and really be more hands-on, train them, and it'll cost less money. 
So there was this couple that had been working for us for about a year and a half. Hardest working couple I've ever met, like to this day. They went above and beyond whenever we asked them to do anything. They were doing odd jobs at our properties like cleaning, maintenance, lawn stuff. So we had trusted them for a long time and they just had great attitudes. We were like, okay, let's Mm -hmm. try this couple out. Let's hire them as employees and see how it goes. So we did and it started off great and we were training them they were doing their jobs and everything. And about six months in, my husband went to the properties one Saturday morning to collect rent. And he noticed that there seemed to be a lot of rent missing. And this wasn't just the normal tenant being laid on rent. There was a significant amount missing. So of course we're calling our employees. Where are you? What do you know what's going on? Of course they're not answering. And it turns out they stole about $6,000 that weekend and disappeared. And we found out that they'd been squatting in vacant rooms in our properties for almost a year. Yeah, so pretty bad. I think the total damages was like $20,000 and there's a warrant out for their arrest. So at the time, that was the worst thing (laughs) that could possibly happen to us. Yeah, so you finally put, you, you finally decide to take that step away from controlling your own properties, which especially when you're in the 20s, that hurts. I almost feel like that hurts a lot more than if you only had a few and you switched over right away because you were feeling the cash flow of that those properties before making that turn. And so instead of hiring a property manager, you hire people, W-2 employees, go that route, and it kind of turns south. What's What's the lesson there for someone who's in the same shoes you were in? I mean, it's so tough. It's it's almost embarrassing to talk about because in hindsight, I'm just like, man, what was I thinking? You know, it just seems so stupid. <laughs> but I share, I like to share it because I hope other people can learn from my mistakes. Well, you hired two people who you thought were good though. I mean, I don't think it's such yeah. a crazy thing to choose to hire someone instead of hiring an actual property management firm. Do you think that was your mistake? Hiring a W-2 employee instead of finding a really good pro- property management firm? Yes. I mean, moral of the story, don't be cheap here. This is not the place to try to cut costs. Go with the qualified, high quality people with a reputation. Hire a legitimate property management company that's licensed, bonded, and insured. Because here's the thing. If that's what we had done and one of their employees had stolen rent or whatever, they would have been liable for all that money, not us. So yeah, huge mistake on my part. And that's why I always tell people, do things the right way. You won't regret it. (laughs) Yeah, I think, you know, when it comes to property management, though, there's a lot of different ways to go. And then obviously there's tons of stories of folks who did it the right way as far as hiring a a property management firm. And then the folks just didn't follow through with the things they had to say. So you, you also have to make sure that no matter who you hire is actually doing what they say, whether that's your own employee or, you know, a firm that works for themselves. Although you make a good point in that scenario, that was their employee, not yours, and it would have not been your problem. Yeah. but And you make a good point too. There's always going to be an aspect of manage the manager. And you can't just leave your company and your assets and your money in somebody else's hands. You really do have to make sure you're following up make sure they're doing their job. You know, nothing's fishy is going on behind the scenes. So, Mm -hmm. so, you know, just make sure you're going to be involved. You can't just be completely hands off when it comes to having that much in assets, that much in real estate. Yeah. And that goes with any service provider. I mean, certainly your property manager is the biggest one when they say, Hey, we're going to, we're going to walk the property every three months. And you say, you know, you make a thing in your calendar where three months out, you just reach out and say, Hey, could you send me some photos of that walk? And you're telling them that you are are managing them in a kind way, in a nice way, not yeah. in a I don't trust you way, but especially when you first got a relationship with property managers, you don't, I mean, it's not that you don't trust them, but you you shouldn't 100% trust them until at least you've created a relationship where you know what that trust is a little bit more. And even then you still have to manage the managers, right? Yeah, for sure. And, and of course I have trust issues now, so <laughs> now that that's happened to me. <laughs> well, I think as business owners, we all do. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, everyone probably promises the best they're going to, they think they're going to provide. And there are some people who actually do that and actually have systems in place to be able to follow through with that. And there's other people who promise 
maybe with the best intentions even, and just simply don't follow through. And as business owners and as property owners, it's it's our responsibility to make sure that the people that promise things to us follow through with it. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So that makes total sense. All right. So big failure choosing to, I don't think it was that big of a failure. I mean, it turned <laughs> out to be a bad thing, but you know, I don't, I understand where, where you were well, coming from. Well, thank you. Thank that. you. <laughs> One of the things you've based your entire adult uh, perspective on is financial literacy. You teach a course on that. We're talking about that right now. I wonder if there are some basic premises that real estate owners, as they're moving into doing this full time, can think about, can do, and maybe can question about their own financial process as they're looking at their books. Yes, that's a great question. When I'm teaching just personal finance and workshops, I always ask this question. I say, hey, if you're trying to save a lot of money in a short amount of time, what sorts of things do you do? People will say, oh, I'll eat out less. I'm not going to shop. I'll make my coffee at home. And all those responses are great. And I begin to notice there's a common theme there. We're all focused on decreasing our expenses. Mm -hmm, And that is absolutely essential because we have to live within our means. And cutting costs is really important to getting towards financial freedom. But there's a limit. There's only so much you can cut your costs. You can't stop buying food. You can't stop paying your rent or your mortgage. So you're a little bit limited. So I always tell people, if you want to increase your savings, there's exactly two ways to do that. You either decrease your expenses or you increase your income. And the great thing about increasing your income is that there's no cap on how much money you can make in a year. There's nothing stopping you from making more money. So if you really want to make the biggest impact, you'll focus on doing both. And that's exactly what my husband and I have done in our real estate business. Maybe twice a year, we'll look at our revenue and our expenses from our rental properties and we'll say, Mm -hmm. let's brainstorm 10 ways that we can increase the revenue just based on what we have, not in terms of acquiring new properties, and then 10 ways to decrease our expenses. It's just a brainstorm. It doesn't mean we're going to do all of them, but it could be something like, well, what if we put in coin-operated laundry in the common areas and then we can generate revenue? What if we raise this person's rent just by $10 a month? Things like that. And then on the expense side, we'll think of other things. You know, if if we're providing cable or internet or utilities, can we switch providers and save money that way? So we'll just do this brainstorm and it really helps us make sure we're focusing on the bottom line and how we can increase total profits. And it just keeps us open-minded. There's so many ways a rental property owner can do that. Yeah, it's like those two lines, your income line and your expense line. The goal is to make them go as far apart from each other, with the income obviously being the top line and the expenses being the bottom line. You can make the expenses line go down, Mm -hmm. and you have proven that, obviously, but you can't push that line as far down as you can push the income line up. Do you feel like you have to spend... Like the one thing I hear when I'm listening to that is, well, wait a minute, don't we have to spend to make, like, don't we have to make investments to make money? So how do you separate the idea of expenses and investments? Well, that's a good point. So yes, I mean, to work towards financial freedom, you do have to find a way to make your money work for you. So I talk about in Money Honey, my savings bucket concept. It's a really, really popular concept because savings used to be really difficult for me. I feel like all these finance gurus say, save 15% of your paycheck, save 20% of your paycheck. And it's not one size fits all, you know, that might work for some people, but not for other people. And then it's like, well, what do I do with the 20%? Where do I put it? Right. So, exactly. Yeah. So I began to think of, well, how can we sort of divide up, divide up our savings goals in terms of timeline? And that's where the savings bucket idea came. So you have four buckets. Bucket number one is for emergency savings. You should always have at least a thousand dollars set aside just for small unexpected expenses. Bucket number two is for medium term savings. So you should have three to six months of living expenses in bucket number two and essentially anything you're saving for within the next 12 months. Then you have bucket three, which is for long-term savings. And this is for anything, any big ticket items that are in the long-term, you know, maybe a down payment on a house, a fund for a wedding, things like that. And because it is long-term, that's the bucket that you're going to want to invest in the stock market. Because these Mm -hmm. are things you're saving for that are 5, 10, 15 years away. And that's how you make your money work for you. And then finally, you have bucket number four, which is for retirement, which for somebody my age, it's it's so far off that, again, you want to get that bucket completely invested in the stock market as well, because that's how your money is really going to grow the most over the long run. 
Man, that's so awesome. Bucket one, emergency. Bucket two is kind of middle emergency. Medium term, yeah. Bucket three is the one that really investment property owners are, are you know, can use to invest. That's the investment bucket. Mm-hmm. And then bucket four is your long term, your retirement, and that should be really out in a, another place. Although obviously properties are an element of that in and of themselves. But as far as how you look at the funds, that's how you break it down. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Well, we are at a half hour. So are there any elements that we missed? Anything that you really thought was a topic that you wanted to share in this conversation before we go? Um, You know, I'll just I'll just point out the importance of income diversification. I think a lot of people think that being 100 percent on a single source of income is safe in some way because you have, you know, if you're a full time salaried employee, you have job stability, income security. But the thing is, what if your hours get cut? What if you lose your job? That's there's really nothing safe about that. And that's where the concept of income diversification comes into play. So having multiple sources of income, that way if one stream is impacted, for example, my rental income was impacted by coronavirus, the only reason I wasn't panicking or acting out of desperation during that month is because I had other income streams keeping me afloat. And I think, you know, anyone at any age can generate other income streams, can create passive income, and can absolutely become financially independent. I love that. And in some ways, that's why staying in your job for a little bit longer makes sense because that's one income stream until you have those other income streams and feel like you can jump a little bit. And so that makes a ton of sense. All right, Rachel, four quick questions with basically one word answers. I didn't prepare you for this, but I think you're going to be okay. Is that all right? Oh, yeah, let's do it. Um, One book that our listeners should read. Well, besides my own, I will say (laughs) The Millionaire Fast Lane by MJ DeMarco. But also your books are great books to read. Absolutely. (laughs) Uh, One podcast that folks should listen to they haven't maybe already. Well, besides yours, Jeremy, I would say (laughs) I love Afford Anything by Paula Pant. Okay, awesome. I haven't listened to that one. I will listen to it. An app that you're using and you love doesn't have to be on this topic, can be any. Mint. Okay, awesome. And finally, who is someone I should invite on this show that can share knowledge on the same topics that you've been so eloquently able to do? Oh my gosh, I can definitely make a lot of intros for you because I know so many real estate investors. I was just on David Pierre's podcast, uh-huh. Military to Millionaire. Okay. Um, he's awesome. He, you know, He's a veteran. He teaches other veterans how to invest, so he would be great. Okay, cool. I love it. Rachel, if folks want to find you or of course, if they want to purchase your books, how can they do so? Yeah. So both of my books, Money, Honey and Passive Income, Aggressive Retirement are available on Amazon and Audible. So you can do e-back, paper book and audiobook. Awesome. Rachel, it's been awesome chatting with you. Your story is inspiring. I love how you've diversified your passive income and that you're helping other people do the same. So thanks so much. And thank you for coming on REI Clarity. Yeah, thank you. Special thanks to Rachel Richards for taking the time to share her insights with us. I really loved her ideas around finances, the four different buckets of money, and the fact that bucket three is really where your investing happens. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways that we can do this stuff, but I hope that her approach and her ideas have expanded your mind around investing and passive income in general. Is real estate investing your only avenue to finances, or do you have others? If you don't, Are there other ones you want to add or are you comfortable with one stream of income? There's nothing particularly wrong with that. It just diversification certainly is going to help to uh, make sure that you're safer and more stable in your financial space. So who do you know that needs to hear this episode? Who needs to understand more about financial literacy and investing? Pick up your phone and send them this episode. Let's help everyone level up. We read every single review. I love that the reviews are growing. There's more and more in there. I've been reading them lately and I really appreciate it. If you've listened to more than one episode of this show and have not yet left a rating or review, I would encourage you to just take the two minutes right now to go over there, give us a five-star rating and articulate what it is you like about this show so that we can do more of it and refine the show to fit your needs and help you take that leap from being a side hustle investor to full time. Also, last thing, please do join us on the REI Clarity Facebook group. It is the place to get clarity, make connections, and implement the systems and strategies we talk about here. You can search us on Facebook. You will find us. There's a gold logo with my face on it. We will see you there. All right. Until the next time, here's to clarity, 
that leads to financial freedom faster. Mm-hmm.